my story starts pretty much like so many other herpetologists or herpetoculturists uh, start their story. We have this, you know, love and a never-ending interest in anything reptile-based. Um, mine particularly was the snakes. So growing up in Arizona, um, as a child, I was constantly out in the desert uh, looking for snakes and lizards and insects and anything that I could, you know, find essentially uh, to satisfy my curiosity with reptiles and, and animals in general. So the areas that I grew up going to as a kid are uh, pretty different from uh, where I go to now. I can remember when the fascination and addiction about this snake uh, started. Uh, I remember going through one of my favorite books, Living Snakes of the World, and going through the pythons and coming to this one page that had essentially a paragraph, if that, um, and it had this incredible looking snake that was jet black, it had this rainbow iridescence on it, and had these yellow bands on its face, and it just looked so different and interesting. And there was, there was nothing about them aside from a general description and where they came from. I can remember at that point just frantically searching for every bit of information I possibly could find that pertained to this animal because everything that I had searched for was essentially the same information, the basic description and a habitat and, and the fact that there's not much known about this animal. Um, so I, I essentially went on a mission to find anything and everything I could, uh, including people that had even laid eyes on this snake. So essentially at that time I had exhausted every ounce of information I could locate via literature or first-hand account from anybody that had, you know, seen one of these animals or, or even held one of these animals or let alone kept one of these animals. So I, I knew at that moment, like, I had to go there. So I had to, I had to go to New Guinea. Um, to see this animal and, 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 and answers or try to answer some of these, these questions um, that I began to have um, and um, yeah and um, that pretty much started it. So I hopped on a plane and I uh, went to New Guinea um, in the mid 2000s not knowing what to expect. Um, I tried to read as many books as I could prior about the place and kind of give myself an idea of what I might be experiencing. But, you know, after 12 plane rides to get to this area, I realized how remote I actually was. And I remember landing in this just essentially a runway in the middle of nowhere um, uh, with people just standing outside wanting to see who was coming, what was coming. Uh, that was, I guess, the highlight of the day. Um, so I get off this plane and I just immediately was uh, awestruck with these mountains around me and these clouds. Uh, and then I saw these incredible people walking around with traditional tire and penis gourds and feathers and everything. And I was just absolutely blown away at the same time. So sad because it was such a poverty stricken area. As individuals, um, obviously we have this amazing imagination and hope that, you know, when we go to these places that, you know, we walk off the plane, we take two steps and we find these animals, but that's not the reality at all, especially in uh, West Papua. Um, it was just tremendous, tremendous amount of hiking and walking and climbing uh, to get to some of these areas. Um, I was just so unprepared for it. Uh, my first trip there, it, it literally almost killed me because uh, I was so out of shape for something like this. Um, and then I remember, you know, returning several times before I actually was able to see one of these animals. Um, I, I don't know if it was that the local people I had befriended finally decided to let me see what I had come to see or if they were testing me or what, but I remember walking up to this clearing 
that was between these huge trees uh, kind of nestled in this cove almost like uh, in the top of the mountain and it was I was gasping for air and you know sweating and my mouth was dry and I saw this animal there and I just immediately froze and it was absolutely the, one of the most incredible moments in my life to see this animal that I've been so fascinated with actually looking at it in the wild and it was very emotional for me at that time um, and after that moment um, I knew that this is what I was going to be doing for the rest of my life is studying these snakes so I've been traveling now to West Papua New Guinea for close to 15 years now uh, I've been visiting a group of people called the Dani uh, who are local uh, indigenous people that live in these mountains that uh, I've befriended and essentially become part of the family um, and every trip I go it's the same thing it's lots and lots and lots of walking and walking in these very very remote areas uh, that you can disappear in and nobody will hear from you again um, looking for these animals um, and I wouldn't trade it for the world um, it's absolutely a passion now West Papua is a very interesting place. If I were to have to describe it, I would say it's very anxious, um, very dangerous. Uh, people still go missing today there. Um, but for whatever reason, I feel very, very comfortable when I'm there. Um, when I'm walking through the mountains looking for these animals, my mind can just be at peace and I can relax, um, which is interesting uh, for such a high stress oriented environment um, in place. So it's, uh, it's become my happy place, I guess, uh, my home away from home. arrows pointed at me, had large rocks threatened to come flying at my face, have my four-wheel drive vehicle stopped in the middle of the road and surrounded by local people demanding money and, you know, having to deal with, you know, local people that have been too intoxicated and uh, had to talk my way out of many scenarios. So it's, uh, it is what it is. So my main research focus with Somalia bull and I is uh, nesting ecology and biology associated with it. So one of the things that's very interesting with Somalia bull and I is they utilize a nest as a permanent uh, source of refuge as well as an area to incubate and brood their um, eggs, which is unlike um, other pythons, um, where they take advantage of opportunity, where Boland's pythons uh, continue to utilize the same nesting area year after year. These nests and burrows that they utilize are a direct result of feeding off of their primary food source, the ground couscous, where they take over the burrow and nest of this animal and then maintain this as their territory uh, for the rest of their life. Uh, in fact, leaving biological factors uh, such as scat and urate close and near to these areas to signal other uh, Boland's pythons that there's an animal living here and um, this is essentially private property. Um, it's a very interesting trait to have uh, with such a large animal like this. Uh, and this is just one other factor of why um, I'm so interested in learning as much as I possibly can about this snake um, in the wild. In this uh, amount of time that I've spent in this area, I have been able to document close to 14 active nests. The data that I'm collecting from these active nesting areas um, have really started to help with uh, a better understanding of what um, these animals are doing um, and how they're surviving in this area. So this is critical information and um, hopefully will help with um, conservation for these animals in the future. I've been extremely fortunate to have uh, several um, sponsors that have uh, been with me from pretty pretty much close to the beginning of, of this uh, 
this life that I live. Um, and uh, without their help, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing to this point. So I'm very, very thankful for the involvement that I uh, get with um, people wanting to help uh, this research.